Welcome to the Nerve Guys podcast, where we discuss movement, performance, and rehabilitation through the lens of the brain and nervous system. The Nerve Guys podcast is hosted by Gareth Kelly and James McCambridge. To find out more about the Nerve Guys or to book into our online or in-person training programs, please visit thenerveguys.co.uk. The Nerve Guys podcast is sponsored by Elite Vision Sticks. Every day, athletes of all levels are reaching their full performance potential with Elite Vision Sticks. Pick up yours today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Nerve Guys podcast. Uh, Today, I'm joined by concussion expert Natasha Wilch. So this is one I'm really excited about. Uh, Concussion as being something that uh, I've always been really curious about just because of how overwhelming it can seem in terms of uh, when you have it, but also when you're trying to treat it. There's uh, a lot of information out there that tends to conflict with each other. So uh, I think hopefully this is going to be pretty eye-opening and uh, wonderful. So Natasha, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, do you mind if we start off, if I just ask, out like, uh, because we treat concussion, people with concussion as like, you know, it's a little part of what we do. You've mm-hmm. taken it on as like, this is your whole thing. And like, uh, why is that? Like, why, why did you decide on concussion? Why is it so... Uh, why is it worth that amount of time I guess is in your opinion yeah um I'm excited to be here thank you for having me um concussion is all I do (laughs) right now for sure concussion in brain health so I own a clinic so I'm from Nanaimo British Columbia Canada so I know we're like across the world from each other um so when I opened my clinic seven years ago I actually treated all neurological so I treated stroke I treated Parkinson's I treated MS, spinal cord, kind of did it all. Um, And then one day there was a client that was referred to me um, by an occupational therapist in town and she had had a concussion that wasn't resolving. Um, And this woman walked through my clinic door and I will never forget her name. I will never forget what she looked like um, because I didn't know what the heck to do because a concussion is not a stroke. A concussion is not Parkinson's. And I'm a physical therapist. So in physical therapy school, we got one hour on concussion and it was all about, here's how you identify a concussion in sport. And then it gets better. (laughs) That was basically, that's basically what I remembered. Um, So with this woman, I really had to kind of like dig back into like my brain and my knowledge and be like, okay, concussion is the brain. What do I know? What can I test? What can I look at? Um, And basically she kind of lit this fire in me. Um, And it brought me back to a spot earlier in my life. I'm going to try and cliff notes this so I don't like take forever to tell this part. Um, My dad experienced a brain injury when I was 17 years old. Um, And so a log rolled off the truck on the back of his head. Um, And back then, like that was 21 years ago, you didn't rehab brain stuff, right? And no one educated him. No one educated my mom. No one educated my brother and I on what that could look like in our life. Um, And, you know, my dad dealt with dizziness. He dealt with headaches. He dealt with light sensitivity and sound sensitivity, short-term memory issues, like would just zone out. There was a lot of things that came out of this for our family that impacted his life, but also our lives. And the fact that 21 years later, as I started getting more concussion clients in my clinic, I was seeing these same trends, hearing the wrong crappy information being dispersed. It just kind of lit this fire in me to be like, this is not okay. Like this is Unfreaking acceptable, especially in today's day and age, and we need to do something about it. So that's kind of like the heart of my of my why. And um, I've always been like I just love to help people as well. And that's kind of but that's like the passion as to why this is in itself so important to me. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think I can definitely relate to to kind of what we were talking about about like faulty information or just like just a lot of weird information and in my experience I generally find two kinds of people with concussion there's one type which is I've just been punched in the head I've got all these symptoms but yeah it'll go away I'm fine like and they will do nothing like they you know next day they're back at work doing all sorts of things and then on the other side of it's just I've been hit in the head I don't know if I'm going to die or not like you know I'm just you're seeing extremes 
yeah yeah and even when i for, was first getting into kind of uh i'd been studying neuroscience and neurology for a little while but i actually saw a comedian on tv uh i think his name was drew lynch and he's a comedian who uh he has a stutter and he's kind of had a brain injury but one of the jokes that he told on the thing was you know uh part of the brain injury that he's got was because he went to sleep on a concussion and he was like and now i know you're not meant to do that and that, that was a whole joke but that scared the crap out of me because uh that suddenly became like oh actually yeah like i think i can understand the brain but if go, like going to sleep is pretty important as far as i'm concerned how how do we deal with that and and i was wondering if i could ask you specifically about things like that like those kind of rumors that get thrown around like you're not meant to sleep on a concussion or you're yeah let's start with that one uh let's let's just yeah see what's yeah on that. so the that's that's kind of right and kind of wrong so the old the old myth the thing we still kind of hear all around is you need to wake someone up every two hours right or you don't let them sleep so let's fine tune that a little bit. So when a concussion happens, it is truly, I always say it's a, it's a, it's a metabolic, physiologic and microstructural injury that has happened to your brain. So there is this process happening, right? That process can evolve over a period of four to six hours, okay? There's also potential, depending on the mechanism of how you got your concussion, that maybe you do have that slow bleed, right? We call it a subdermal, subdermal hematoma. It is a slow bleed. It doesn't show up right away. And so over that, but it will evolve over that four to six hours. So when you first get a concussion, you don't want to sleep for the first four to six hours, because that's where you're going to start to notice if someone is decreasingly losing consciousness, or they're starting to have a harder time with their words, or their headache is getting worse. If any of those symptoms are evolving to that degree, then it's straight to the emergency room. Um, but after that four to six hours, if there was, if there was no red flags initially in the presentation of a concussion, we can talk about those if you want to, but if there was no red flags initially, um, and if it hasn't evolved and then, then you want to, then let people sleep. You don't need to wake them up every two hours. You don't need to keep them awake for 24 hours after that four to six hours. If everything is good and nothing's evolved or gotten worse, you can let them sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually just. I guess, yeah, paying attention, cl paying close attention at the beginning. Uh, and then I guess, yeah, like those red flags that you talked about, what should be, if someone gets hit in the head or like a whiplash yeah. or anything like that, well, what do you normally recommend people to watch out for or what should they do right away? Yeah. So any scenario. So, I mean, it's funny because most people still think I did a poll once on my Instagram and it was this question, the question I asked was, why didn't you think you had a concussion? Because over 50% of concussions don't go, get missed. They don't get diagnosed. So it was like, why didn't you think you had a concussion? And the majority of the answer was because I don't play sports. So like quick, like clarification, obviously anyone can get a concussion. Um, and the highest reason people actually get concussions, the highest statistical reason is from falls, just period, falls. It's the biggest yeah. reason people get concussions, but we think of car accidents, work incidences, right? So it's not just on the sport field or the ice or the pitch or whatever the heck it is sport you play. So if you have an incident, whatever it is, where you've hit your head or there's the potential that a concussion has been sustained, um, you want to remove yourself from that situation for sure. Um, the red flags that are like, you go to the hospital or you go to the doctor right away, right? Are obviously you've lost consciousness. Um, you have numbness or tingling kind of in the arms or the extremities, the body, you're seeing double vision, you have tons of neck pain or head pain, um, nausea, vomiting, seizure-like activity, or we call it posturing. So when you have the concussion, your body goes into this like interesting posture. Um, those are word for, like word finding or memory issues. So we, my son races BMX. Um, and we were at the BMX park. There's like a big jump park and the track and all this stuff. Um, and there was a kid who 100% got a concussion and he was repeating the same sentences and the same questions every two minutes, like hospital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so those are those kind of immediate red flags. If those things aren't showing up right away, but then over that period of time, you start seeing them like, okay, so now there's, they seem to not remember what they've talked about or 
they just seem a little bit more fatigued or more like tired or they're slower. So it's like that slowly decreasing consciousness. They're complaining of increasing neck pain or increasing head pain. All of those things are reasons to still go to the hospital. Um, and then Im- concussions don't show up on imaging. So CAT scans, x-rays, MRIs, we can't see a concussion on those, but they will do those imaging if they're concerned of something else, if they're concerned of a bleed or a fracture or something like that, because it will rule out those other serious injuries as well. Yeah, yeah. I remember actually being in Brazil and seeing a show where the one of the performers got hit pretty, pretty hard on the head. Um, and the next day we were kind of going, oh, so what, like, you, did you get diagnosed with concussion? And he kind of went, well, no, because in Brazil we just don't do that. Like we, we don't really even consider it a thing we, we you know, we deal mm-hmm. with the more serious symptoms uh, afterwards, but uh, for a concussion, they just sort of go, well, yeah, you're concussed. There go you back go. in. <laughs> just yeah. like have a rest or, or, or do whatever, um, whatever it is you want to do. Um, we, and they also said, yeah, don't look at screens, which was another rumor that I thought I might ask you about, well, like the, how much validity enough, is there. So I've actually watched this go through a couple different phases now, to be honest. So um, there was a phase where it was like, don't do screens, like it's not going to help. And then there was a phase where it was like, you know what, do them. But in like in those first 48 hours, like it's fine. Um, But if he starts to flare your symptoms, like come off of them. Um, But there was a study that just came out actually, like within the last, I think it was this year, actually, it was either this year or the end of last year that looked at acute concussion recovery and screen use. And they found that the people who eliminated screens in the first 48 hours had a faster recovery rate than those who didn't then then use screens. So now based on that study, I'm telling people no screens for 48 hours, or if you need to use a screen, like minimal, minimal. And then after that 48 to 72 hours. So anytime someone gets a concussion, it's 48 to 72 hours of rest. And then it's a gradual reintroduction of activity in life, right? So you don't dive back into life, <laughs> but yeah. it's a gradual reintroduction of activity. Um, and so now based on this recent study that came out that it was like a, I'm trying to remember the actual, it was a significant, like I feel it was like a five day difference in time of the people of recovery of people who didn't use screens versus, versus those that were allowed to use screens. And it was in those first 48 to 72 hours. So now I say no screens or like super minimal because I do my check-ins via an app phone, an yeah. app with my clients. So it's like, I want you to do the check-in, but then I want you to put your phone away. Um, you know, I want, if you need to talk to your friend, like have a conversation instead of texting on a screen um, based on this recent study that it was, it was quite a significant difference between those that they eliminated screens for this first 48 to 72. But then after that, like after the research does not support r- strict rest or restriction of activities after 72 hours it's more it's more it's a gradual introduction of stay below symptom exacerbation so if screens are bothering you you know you're on your screen for like three minutes and then you start to get pounding headaches like yeah okay don't go on your screen (laughs) but then let's also start to figure out if this is persisting and this is where I come into play with my clients. Obviously, if things are persisting, what is the root cause of why these symptoms are still happening? And then let's treat it. Let's not just try to manage it. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, actually what I was going to ask you. <laughs> the next yeah. was about like these, because uh, I guess that's a lot of the time when we are working with people, it is always like, you know, uh, it's whatever you're doing. Don't If your symptoms are coming back, you're doing too much of it or or something like that and yep. a question we get a lot though is like well what do those symptoms actually mean like why and and it was given what you said about this is a five-day difference in recovery for some people it's like oh well if i can still do my thing i'll wait five days but is that like uh what are what is the potential of that those symptoms might lead to or i guess yeah so i am I'm a big proponent of getting to the root cause of a symptom and treating that to then address the symptoms as opposed to just managing the symptoms. And the example I say is, you know, there's, depending on where you read, anywhere from five to seven different kinds of headaches, right? A headache is a symptom. Yeah, I could take Tylenol and that manages the headache, 
but I could also find out why that headache is happening, treat that, and then the headaches go away, right? So it's the, are you going to manage the symptom for the rest of your life? Or are you going to figure out why the heck it's happening and address it so that you don't have to manage it for the rest of your life? And I think sometimes there's still this, this lack of education. This is where, like a part of what we're trying to do too, is say, you don't just have to live with these symptoms. You don't just have to manage symptoms. We can figure out ideally <laughs> where the root cause of the symptom is coming from treat that. And then that will help your symptoms. So that's where I come into play with my clients all the time. Right. So I do, I see clients locally in my clinic, but I also see clients, clients fly in from all over North America to come do what we call a concussion intensive. Um, and they work intensely with me for one week. Um, and in that intensive, we do a super detailed, it's like a two hour assessment where I'm figuring out where, and I assess the different systems, sorry. So we know with concussion, that there's now these, what we talk about is clinical profiles and different phenotypes, right? So you can have an autonomic or physiological concussion, an ocular motor, which is your eyes, vestibular system, which is like inner ear dizziness, um, cervical, so neck, um, sleep is some people put sleep in there as one. Um, some people put headaches in there as one. It's kind of a funky one, um, anxiety and mood. And I'm missing one. Can't remember what it is off the top of my mind. Like, I can't remember what I've said. Anyways, identifying the type of concussion, the clinical profile helps us then tr- treat that actual root cause because dizziness, for example, everyone says I get dizzy. Dizzy is a really vague word. It's an umbrella word to describe mm-hmm. a lot of different symptoms, but just dizziness as a whole can come from your neck, can come from your eyes, can come from your vestibular system. So if all you're doing is treating the person's neck for dizziness, but you've never assessed their visual or vestibular system, or all you're doing is giving them meds to help decrease the vertigo and the feeling of imbalance, for example, but you've never assessed these symptoms to figure out where it's coming from, then you're missing a big piece of the picture. And that's where, that's the piece is like, we want people to know, and I want people to know, like, you can do something about this. (laughs) Mm. You just have to connect with the people who treat it and understand it and, and do it. Yeah, yeah. And that's not usually the doctors. Yeah, um, that seems to be like the experience I've had. And yeah, anyone I speak to is kind of, you go to hospital, they just go, well, yeah, it's not serious enough for us to to want to deal with it. Go back to, to whatever. Um, and how soon would you kind of, like you sort of said, those 72 hours rest when, yeah. when people are thinking <laughs> about, you know, come and see you. How soon are you thinking about putting in uh you know those vision or vestibular i mean i know you probably do the assessments but is it straight into vision vestibular work or is it more nope. kind of uh, breathing cardio that kind of thing so i it depends on where you kind of in my ideal space so there's certain clients that i have that i especially my athletic clients for example um i have baselines on them so they all know how to reach me really quickly um but usually I'll connect with people in the first, like within that first day or two of their concussion and just give them that initial, like, okay, here's rest. I want you to do breathing exercises. I want you, I'm do, I, I give them homework that's restful, but that is going to engage the parasympathetic nervous system as much as possible in the first three days. Um, and then I like to see people in clinic between day four and seven. And so between day four and seven, we're going to do, so I'm not going to do a detailed assessment, but I'm going to do screen. So I'm going to screen the vestibular system. I'm going to screen the visual system. I'm going to screen the autonomics. I'm going to screen the neck. Um, and we're going to get you started on a gradual aerobic program because the research is showing us over and over and over and over and over again, that if we can get someone started on a gradual sub threshold, so sub symptomatic aerobic exercise program, they improve faster. Um, if someone, so we start on that on day four. Um, if there is the other thing too, with some of those visuals, some of those vestibular, some of those, those symptoms that might show up in those first days, they can be transient in nature up to that first week, the research is showing us. So I do my screens, um, but I don't give treatment usually in that first week, except for the gradual exercise and the parasympathetic piece of things. Um, but if come day 10, our symptoms are in like, if our symptoms aren't improving, um, kind of after that first week, and if they're still kind of struggling, then I start to dig deeper for sure. The research is showing us that, you know, if day 14, 
if things aren't resolving, it's likely because we're looking at also the dysfunction of either one of these other clinical phenotypes. So we need to be looking more there. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I was wondering actually as well, the uh, for the aerobic exercise, uh, a lot of that I uh, guess is getting improving the blood flow to the brain right. for you know fl uh, flushing out whatever toxins etc um do you ever explain a bit of what's going on I, I find some people find it terrified if i try to explain what happens in a head injury um but for me, I find it really useful to, are you able to talk a little bit about, you know, yes. what actually happens in your head that like, you know, why would you need to maybe improve blood flow or improve aerobic exercise? Yeah. So I actually talk about it with all my clients um, because concussion is one of those things that it's invisible to the naked eye. Right. And so we can't actually see it. So I have this diagram that I actually, I, I on a handout that I actually bring out with my clients because it's just, and it's this piece of, you know, I don't need you to memorize this, but I want you to understand that something actually happened in your brain. Like there's a physiological process that happened to explain why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And I know it really freaking sucks that you can't see it, but I want to show you a picture of what happened so that you understand that there's a correlation between, okay, something real actually trans like transpired. This is why I feel this way. And it can be so validating for our clients, I think too. Right. Mm -hmm. But I keep it pretty simple um, because it's, I say to them, I said, there's this thing called a neurometabolic cascade. All you really need to know is that what happens in a brain injury and what happens with concussion is there is, it's an acceleration deceleration. So a whiplash mechanism, it can cause shearing of the axons and the, which are like your big highways in your brain, which translates information. Um, and, and there's an inflammation process that happens as well. And basically because of what has happened, the energy that your brain needs which it gets from all its nutrients and the blood flow, the energy it needs to take care of this reaction that's happened is more than it has. So we're in a little bit of an energy crisis. So when you start to do things too much right now, you're putting more demand on your brain than it has the capacity to serve. Um, and so we want to, this is why we need rest in these first few days. Um, and then one of the things that happens, the reason, except they people are like, why are you giving me breathing exercises? Like, why are you telling me to put my face in cool water? <laughs> like all these things. And I say, one of the things that's been shown over and over again in concussion as well is we get this uncoupling of our autonomic nervous system, right? So we get this uncoupling from our cardiovascular system and, and de which ultimately decreases to the autonomic nervous system, which then decreases blood flow to the brain. Now, that's the most accepted thing right now. There's, they're constantly researching blood flow and what that looks like. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's mm -hmm. less. Um, depends on a zillion factors, but blood flow can be interrupted. And this is the physiological kind of subtype of concussion. And we know that someone has this when they experience exercise intolerance, right? And so what we want to do is with this sub threshold type of activity, it starts to increase that blood flow back to the brain um, and helps you with that healing process. So, oh my gosh. I'm sorry if you can hear my puppy in the background. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's this mix of, you know, this, this sub threshold exercise has been helped to show, to reduce symptoms. It's been helped. So one of the other things and one of the other kind of studies is what happens is people have developed carbon dioxide sensitivity, um, but the sub threshold exercise has been shown to help resolve that as well. So it's just being shown over and over again to help resolve the effects of concussion and that inflammatory process that kind of happened to bring you back to your resting yeah yeah and that's uh i think interestingly as well we always recommend usually like treadmills or exercise bikes for a lot of people just because like what you were saying about the maybe there's a vestibular or a vision problem actually if they're going to go for a run or something like that or do you know, lots of lunges where their head's moving up and down and actually the light is changing we kind of tell them, oh, actually, you know, you might get away with that. It might be fine, but you might find that if you're just on a stationary bike where, you know, your head doesn't move, uh, m maybe that's going to yeah. be a well, little and for, better. For anyone that I know that's dealing with vestibular, so if anyone's got significant cervical, vestibular, or visual issues that I know of um, that have kind of come up in screens, it's the bike right away for sure. Yeah. Because the treadmill is like exactly like you just described, like that motion that you described, that's going to flare their symptoms. So then you don't know if you're looking at, is this exercise intolerance 
or is this because I flared one of the other systems with yeah. the symptoms that they produce? So for those exact reasons that you just listed. Just yeah. trying to isolate it, isolate yeah. as many different parts as, as you possibly can. Yeah. And you kind of talked as exactly. well about um, that acceleration, deceleration from a kind of whiplash. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I found interesting as well was that uh, people like you don't necessarily have to be hit on the head to have oh. a concussion, do you? Um, no, so no. actually, you can get that just from any kind of fast movement of the neck. Yeah. So the definition when we actually look at it, um, thank you for like that's what's still one of the oldest myths out there that is that still perpetuates. Honestly, still perpetuates today. Um, you don't need to hit your head and you don't need to lose consciousness to have a concussion. So, uh, definition is basically, it's a biomechanical force, um, that causes either to the head, neck or elsewhere on the body that transmits that force up to the brain. So yeah, you do not need to hit your head at all to be diagnosed with a concussion anymore. Um, and then, yeah, you also don't need to lose consciousness. And I think, I think statistically it's actually only about 10% of people who experience a concussion actually lose consciousness yeah so it's a really small number and then based on that uh I, and i think you also mentioned about people who didn't think that they were concussed mm -hmm. um do you deal with a lot of people who like way later down the line because uh, i guess you will be dealing with post-concussion syndrome but are there people who you know only piece it together like a long time in the future yeah so this is sometimes the tricky part um because of the <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, it's harder sometimes, I think, for people to get support for it when it kind of starts to get pieced together later down the road, to be honest. Um, because of the pathophysiology of like, so that neurometabolic cascade, that process that actually happens in the brain, if someone has a concussion from that incident, symptoms just physiologically on that timeline will show up in the first what zero to, to two to three days. But sometimes what happens is the symptoms that show up are subtle. And so say someone gets a concussion on a Friday um, and then they have a chill weekend and then say they're on vacation and it's a relaxing vacation and then they don't go back to work or back to like regular life with their normal demands for a couple of weeks, they may not even recognize that they've had a concussion because they haven't pushed or taxed their brain the way they normally would. And they've been kind of in this restorative state. So I've absolutely seen that happen. Um, and those ones are harder because sometimes it's harder for the, not harder to treat, but it's harder for the client to piece together why they're feeling the way they're suddenly yeah. feeling. And sometimes it's hard from I've seen like from the doctor to be like, well, you were fine. It's like, well, they were, but they weren't doing their regular demands, right? Like they weren't pushing their brain where they would normally would. So, it, and it was subtle. So it got missed. Um, and then it kind of just kind of evolved. So yes, absolutely. I've seen both of that. Yeah. I mean, that's a <laughs> huge one for us is, uh, I mean, I know people because working with athletes and stuff all the time and in the circus, I know a lot of people who I'm pretty sure I was there when I think they had a concussion, but, and this is, you know, years down the line and, uh, and they'll still swear by, well, no, not at all, but I still can't figure out these mood swings that I've got or, or this, you know, right. headache or neck pain that just keeps coming back. And, uh, you know, are, are there things, if anyone was, uh, listening and, uh, I, I don't know, I don't want to, start suggesting to people that they they might have things that they maybe no, don't no, no. but you know <clears throat> if they're seeing a grouping of a load of symptoms uh what would you say to look for that you know maybe maybe they might have had a concussion or maybe actually just uh some some of the same treatments might be helpful yeah i think it's more option two to be honest because the way i always look at it i'm treating the person that's sitting in front of me today right so whether you've had one concussion, two concussions, I, I, that's important to me. I want to know that. I do want to know the trajectory of what happened, but ultimately I'm sitting, I'm treating you, the person sitting in front of me in this moment. So if you're someone who's dealing with recurrent headaches, that's not normal. If you're dealing with recurrent neck pain, that's not normal. If you're dealing with dizziness, 
that's not normal, right? So if you have any, sorry, I'm losing my voice more and more here. If you're dealing with these symptoms that are impacting your quality of life, to me, that's what it kind of always comes back to, right? Like, A, no one should live with headaches every day. No one should live with neck pain every day. A lot of people choose to, to be honest. A lot of people are like, that's just, you know, chronic neck pain is just kind of what I got. But if it's impacting your quality of life and the way you want to live your life, then connect with somebody who can help you, right? We talked about a little bit earlier about, you know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of what I call a, multi, a multimodal assessment and treatment plan, because I don't believe that our, our body and like our minds and our bodies, it can't be separated at all. Um, and our systems don't operate in silo. They communicate, they integrate over and over and over again. So neck pain, for example, <clears throat> when someone has chronic neck pain, a lot of people think to, I'm going to go to a physio or a, a chiro or osteo or whatever, whoever, um, exercise physiologist, there's some really skilled professions out there. Um, and they work on the neck, right? And they mm. work on the neck and they work on the neck and they work on the neck. Oh, my chronic neck pain is never going away. I've seen all these people. They've worked on my neck. It doesn't, it's not happening. Well, the neck can also be impacted by your eyes. The neck can also be impacted by your vestibular system. So what I'd say to people is if you've tried something and I'm going to say, don't just try one person, like one person, it doesn't represent an entire profession, right? So, but if you've tried a few different things that are all kind of manual therapy based, let's say, and it's not working, then be open to trying a different approach. Be open to trying something different through a new lens or someone who does, or like looks at kind of that more whole picture and what else could be impacting this besides just like the manual, the tissues, the bones, the nerves around the neck, like where else could this come from? Um, that would kind of be like my overarching, like if you're dealing with any sort of symptom that's recurrent, uh, A, that's not fun and you shouldn't have to, but B, ask yourself this question, like, is it impacting the quality of life or the quality of life I desire to have? And if it is, connect with someone who can help shed some light on it. I have people that come to me who I'm like, I am not your person, um, but let's find you someone who is right? Like you, we all have, I'm sure you guys do too. We all have our referral networks that we refer to because we all want the best outcome for our clients. And a lot of the time that's working with, with ourselves or like with you, with your clients, but sometimes it's, you know what, I'm going to refer you to Jack down the street because here's what I think might be happening. And he might be able to support you better than that. And that's the beauty of team and healthcare. Mm, yeah. It's really interesting because I guess that's the that's part of the thing about when you go to see the doctor is they always tell you this is what you have and it but part of that is because if they don't then you go away going oh that's a terrible doctor he couldn't tell me what was wrong with me and and that's just become the accepted thing that you know we go to the doctor they should know what's up and if they don't it's because they don't know what they're doing not because maybe I'm a little complicated or maybe they're just the human body's a little bit complicated. Yeah. And there's kind of two sides to that in there though. Cause you know, you could go, well, I've got this neck pain and head pain that could point to, oh, maybe I had a concussion years ago. And so I should get that sort of that, but actually it doesn't really matter if you, if you make it better, then does it matter that it was a concussion or that you had, you know, vision problems or, you know, you've just got very focal glasses. So suddenly you're having to use your, head more as long as you fix the problem then it shouldn't really matter but then a lot of people do feel better knowing or they are they they believe the problem can be fixed if they know what it is so if you if you tell me yes. i've got a concussion and then you go but don't worry concussions can be fixed then it's cool okay and whereas you go i don't know what's wrong with you but the good news is that doesn't matter <laughs> like headaches can well, be and fixed. i think There's going to be, I mean, there's going to be certain things that come up saying in an assessment that you're going to be like, you know what, like this just looks like a vestibular hypofunction or, you know, this could have come from a question or the person assessment is going to be like, this is, they're going to pick up on like, you know what, I think we need to refer you for some, like a more lookup. Right. So I think too, depending on, depending on what the symptom is, obviously, um, and what's showing up, there's going to be those times where you know what, this could have come from that fall, or this could have come from that concussion. Um, but let's work on this together. Or it's going to be, you know what, 
there's a couple things I'm uncertain about here. Let's kick you back to your doctor and let's get a referral to an ENT or a neurologist or whatever it is, because here's, here's what I'm seeing. And I would just like to look at this a little more closely. And that's definitely happened. Like I've had clients come in who's got like, it was, uh, he was diagnosed with a just like weakness. He was like orthopedic that was coming in and he walked into my clinic and I was like, Oh no, like it's, it's that. And I was like, and called his doctor and got him a referral to neurology because the second I assessed him, it was like, he's got MS. <laughs> like there's no, mm. there's no question. Right. There's been people that I've assessed who come in with potential concussion that I've assessed that I'm like, you know what? Some things just aren't clicking. Like let's get an MRI. Like, let's just, let's kick you back. Just, I just want to be sure. Right. And so when you see someone or a healthcare provider who, who kind of has that skill set and knows what they're looking at, they're going to kick you back ideally to, to your, well, in Canada, your GP has to be the person that orders everything, your general mm. practitioner. Um, so that we're going to kick you back to your general practitioner with a note saying, Hey, like, this is what I'm seeing on assessment. I feel like we need a referral to X, Y, and Z. Like, can we look a little closer at this? Um, because then they'll get that label and that title to help them kind of navigate the system better too, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. Um, so I wanted to also, just cause I know we don't have loads of time left, uh, and I, we've kind of covered a bunch of topics and I wanted to just make sure if anyone's tuned in specifically, cause they're worried about either they've, they've had a concussion or they might have a concussion or they know someone, uh, I wanted to see if we can just go through like a, a general, mm -hmm. Uh, we've talked about some of it already, but just the general, like, you know, all right, you've just been hit in the head. Uh, we're saying 72 hours of no yeah. screens and <clears throat> kind of general rest and rest. And then what are they going to, what are they going to do next? Well, are, are yeah. actually red flags, I guess, first. And then, yeah. So if you yeah. have it, so you experience a concussion, um, you're ruling out those red flags first. If, and on my Instagram, I think I've posted what the red flags are about 7,000 times. Um, so you're <laughs> ruling out the red flags. If there are red flags, I always say if there's red flags or you're just really uncertain, go to the hospital um, and just make sure. And then they'll rule out those red flags for you. Um, and then from there, it's no sleep for four to six hours um, just to see if something more serious evolves. And then after that, you can sleep, right? You can have a great night's sleep. You don't need to wake someone up. You're going to do 48 to 72 hours, depending on the person of rest. And that means actual rest, like sleep breathing exercises, listen to an audiobook, relax. You can have conversations. You can try and watch a little bit of TV, but you want to do don't want to do anything that flares your symptoms. And by screens, this is actually where this it's like computers, cell phones, tablets, those sorts of things. Um, no screens for the first 48 hours either. Um, and then after 48 to 72, this is where we start gradual reintroduction of activity. So both physical, like aerobic activity and general activity. This is also where I say, please connect with a health provider who can support you. <laughs> yep. Um, the research is showing us again and again, the sooner you connect with a health provider who can support you and understands concussion, the better your, like the trajectory of your recovery is going to be. There's a lot of little questions that come up in these first phases and having someone to bounce those off is great. Um, because on that day three, day four is when, when you're going to start doing aerobic activity, staying below everything you do in this first like week, is to stay below elevating your symptoms. So if you push your symptoms and you elevate your symptoms, you need to stop. You need to rest. Pushing through is not going to get you anywhere. It's going to slow you down. Um, that's for the first week. And then one week to 10 days. And then between that 10 to 14 day mark, if we're still experiencing, if, if we're not showing improvement, um, that's when we start to look at a little bit more detailed kind of treatment and, and things like that too. So the rule, uh, kind of what I say to everyone is don't try to figure it out on your own. <laughs> um, truly do connect with someone who they are knowledgeable in this area. And the, I can't even say like what profession that would be, because honestly, there's so many professions that work with concussion, physical therapy, chiropractic, osteopathy, ex exercise, physiology, kinesiology, athletic therapist, like the list goes on. But what I will say is it's usually someone that falls into that allied health professional range. It's not the neurologist. It's not the doctor. It's not the physiatrist. Yes, we need those people on our healthcare teams, um, but they're not the people who are going to rehab you through this process. But that would kind of be like the short, like initial piece with the biggest advice being just connect with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once you're, once you're connected with someone, then you're, 
<laughs> you've got someone for all the other steps exactly um, and uh, like that is the the thing i mean i don't know how it is in canada but then the the big worry that people have over here all the time is oh well how much is that going to cost me because uh, as we said you know do, well, i'll go to the gp but the gp will uh, will say are you know go go to hospital if hospital is fine you're okay are there any resources i know for a start your instagram account is amazing for Thank just you. information about uh concussion i've been uh following that for a few years now and just natasha wilch natasha, natasha dot wilch dot wilch yeah. yeah uh so definitely check that out if uh you're curious about you know uh finding things out are there any other online resources that you recommend for people or just stuff that people can find for oh cheap or free just in case um yeah there's oh gosh for that acute phase i mean there's tons i mean and most people like i respond to every single message i get as well on instagram um i won't give you medical advice um and i would say too it's i mean i talk about putting activity back in there um there's a lot of different resources for the persistent concussion phase out there right now i honestly in terms of parachute canada is a resource that has like they have tons of resources on there um there's a website called cat c-a-t-t online that has a bunch of different like free resources as well and videos um heads up is another one that has a bunch of different free resources and videos um the university of calgary obviously i know a lot of canadian resources the university yep. of calgary used to have I don't know if they still do, um, but they used to have a free like little course that you could walk yourself through to get some more information if this was an area that interests you to kind of educate you on the processes as well. Um, yeah, for the uh, there's there's a, a whole bunch more for persistent. Like there's a lot of community based educational resources for persistent concussion, um, but that acute bit. Then here's the nice thing too is if you connect early, you shouldn't have to spend tons of money. Yeah. Right? 80 per, 70 to 80 percent of people recover within the first two to four weeks. Right. So I would say, and I know everyone's different in their healthcare and insurances and stuff like that, but it would be worth the investment in yourself, at least for that initial appointment to get some guidance. Cause I guarantee you that provider is going to have resources for you as well. Yeah. So it would be it would be worth that initial investment in that one appointment, at least for yourself to get guidance, um, to help set you on the right path, because taking care of yourself in this acute phase is one of the biggest predictor of people developing persistent symptoms. And I don't, I don't want you to go down that road. Yeah. That's a bit, I really think is best to highlight of and why I kind of brought it up because I know mm -hmm. a lot of the times when people hear like I'll oh, see a professional and it's just uh but uh you know you, this is one that I just invest in that invest in yeah. at least the one visit yeah uh yeah. you can mitigate so much um but also those resources that's a lot of resources and uh yeah if uh, people need to send you a message as well that is uh, they are more than welcome to amazing so um natasha we're gonna have to start finishing up because i know uh we've we've got a cut off time uh so all i want to say is thank you so much for that uh that's a ton of information uh, explained really really well um if anyone is uh you know interested in that that stuff as i said definitely go check out natasha.wilch on instagram there's so much information on there uh reach out with a message if uh you're you know you've had a concussion experience any symptoms anything like that um but yeah thank i would you. be i would be happy to come join you again as well if that was if your audience felt like that would be great Amazing. Yeah. Actually, if, uh, if we get some questions in from people that, uh, that they want to ask, uh, we might, we might even just get that arranged. I would cool. be happy to do so. Well, uh, I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your morning then. Uh, thank you very much again. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll chat again soon.